the Jack Benny Program, with Mary Livingston, Rochester, Dennis Day, and me, Don Wilson. And now, the man who secretly wonders if his violin makes his head look fat, Jack Benny. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the show. Because it's the Christmas season, I thought I'd start by doing something extra special for you, you know. So what I'd love to do right now is play my very favorite Christmas carol for you folks on the violin. You know, the violin lends itself so wonderfully to Christmas music. I find it soothing and relaxing, and I know you will too. I shall now perform for your listening pleasure a rendition of that most beloved and sentimental Christmas classic, Silent Night. Mr. Benny! Rochester, can't you see I'm doing a show? I'm busy right now. All these people came here to be entertained. Oh, sorry, boss. They must be very disappointed. <laughs> no, they're not. I was delighting them by playing Silent Night. You know, that's not a number normally played on the violin. And you were doing a good job. Thank you. Because it sure didn't sound like you were playing it normally. <laughs> It's a difficult piece to play. The way you play it, it's also difficult to listen to. Cut that out. What is it you wanted, anyway? I wanted to ask you for a raise. Now? You pick now as the time to ask me for a raise? Well, the last time I asked you for a raise, you told me you'd think it over and get back to me this Christmas. I did? When did I say that? June of 1947. <laughs> I'm still thinking. He can't possibly expect me to rush headfirst into making rash financial decisions. And it's too close to Christmas to spend money. You said that in June of 1947, too! <laughs> yes, folks, that's our very own Scrooge right there. It was the night before Christmas, and all through the house, not a creature was stirring. Not even this louse! I can hear you, Don. All the stockings were hung by the chimney with care. Except for that stingy old miser who couldn't even be bothered to lift a finger to get anything nice for anybody. I was just about to go Christmas shopping at Goodman's department store, for heaven's sake. I got my list right here. Gold cufflinks, silk pajamas, a Cadillac. Oh, those are the things I'm asking Santa Claus to give me. My shopping list is on the other side. Toothbrush for Dennis, shoelaces for Don, and something nice for Mary. And I'm not a miser. It's just that if you wait to shop until the last minute, you can pick up some real bargains on toothbrushes and shoelaces, especially in the second-hand store. Well, here we are at the department store. I wonder where the jewelry department is. Oh, young man, young man, excuse me, do you work here? See? Si. So you're familiar with the store? See? Si. Then you know where everything is located? See? Si. What's your name? Sai. Sai? Si. Sai. What department is it that you work in? Suits. Suits. Si. What do you do in the suits department, Sai? So. So. Si. I'm afraid to ask the next question. Sai, what floor is the jewelry department? Six. Six. Si. Thank you. You're welcome. Holy smoke! Did you say you're welcome? Oh, cut it out, will ya? Oh, good. Here's the elevator. What floor, sir? Six. I mean, six. Please. Excuse me. Excuse me. Gee, it's so crowded. Give a fella a little breathing room, will ya? Going up! Christmas toys for girls and boys, sweaters, shirts, and ties. Here you'll find a niche in wines and toothpicks any size. Excuse me, plays, is the six floor? Buttons, hooks, and bows. Look, I want the six floor. Jewelry, let the out. Bows, rubber this is feet, my floor. Rubber feet, treats, instant underpants. What? Spider eggs and hedgehog legs and radioactive plants. We'll Are find you a way to take your pay as you go through our store. Before you know, we'll get your bill a thousand bucks or more. Let me out of here. Yikes. So this must be the jewelry department. My, everything looks so expensive. <laughs> oh, mister, mister. Yes? Are you the salesperson here? No, I'm wearing this flower in my lapel because I'm going to be a float in the Rose Bowl parade. <laughs> 
He thinks he's funny. One of us better be. <laughs> oh, don't be smart. I was wondering if you could help me buy a gift. Is it for a business associate? That's right. How did you know? You don't look like the type who has any friends. <laughs> oh, stop that. Now look, I'm looking for a woman. Aren't we all, buddy? She works for me. <laughs> I'd like to show her my appreciation. Do you have something I can look at? You know, something not too expensive. Something inexpensive. All right, all right, cheap. Show me something cheap. Ooh, I have something in the mirror you can look at. Stop that. Can I carouse around those showcases over there? Yes, but just this once if you promise to never do it again. Oh, no. I'll just see what you have here. Say, that little hat pin in the counter right here looks very nice. You can see that itsy bitsy teeny tiny hat pin there from where you're standing. I'm standing right next to it. Besides, I have good eyes. My doctor says I have the eyes of a young man. Well, then you better give them back right away because you're getting them all wrinkly. <laughs> Very funny. My friends think I'm as funny as that comedian on the radio. You mean Jack Benny? No, Milton Berle. <laughs> Just my luck. I so enjoy meeting someone who thinks Milton Berle is funnier than Jack Benny. <laughs> Ooh, then this is your lucky day. I'll have you know, I don't hear anyone on radio funnier than Jack Benny. Have you tried sitting closer to your radio? <laughs> I wasn't asking for your advice. Just tell me, how much is that hat pin? It's a steal at $65. A steal? Who's stealing from who at that price? <laughs> Say, how about that ring over there? It's got an interesting design. Yes, it does. This is the Palomino diamond ring. The Palomino diamond ring, you say? That sounds very intriguing. How did it get that name? Well, a hundred years ago, during the gold rush, a miner was excavating this diamond. Excavating? That means he was digging the diamond out of the mine. I know what excavate means. Oh, you must be the bright one in the bunch. <laughs> And while he was in the mine excavating, the mine entrance collapsed in on him. Oh my, was he trapped? Have you ever heard of a miner in a cave and the entrance caving in where he wasn't? That's terrible. Yes, and then his faithful horse ran away. Well, his horse couldn't have been very faithful if she ran away. To get help. When the townsfolk saw his horse in town without the miner, they knew he was in trouble and needed help. She came back with the town's sheriff, the deputy, the blacksmith, the blacksmith's apprentice, and 14 cowhands. That's an amazing horse that could carry all of them. They rode their own horses. Oh, I see. They followed the Palomino to the mine. Hey, buddy, who's telling who the story here? Sorry. They followed the Palomino to the mine. I just said that! Did they save him? We have the diamond, don't we? You must have graduated tops in your class, didn't you? <laughs> They credit his Palomino for his rescue. And that's why they call it the Palomino Diamond Ring. Oh, you must have graduated with honors. <laughs> can I ask, how much does it cost? Certainly you can ask. It's a free country. I can't stop you. All right, all right. How much does it cost? It's a steal at... Another steal? Who are you, Jesse James? At $100. $100? What is that diamond made out of, anyway? Gold? No, Professor. It's made of diamond. <laughs> I'll stick with the hat pin. <laughs> See what I did? I made a little joke. Stick with the hat pin. That's like how I do the jokes on my radio show, you know. Yes, little. <laughs> well, One hundred dollars. I certainly hope it includes the engraving. Yes, it does. What would you like to put on it? The price. Sorry, that won't fit. <laughs> then what else do you recommend? Well, if she has to put up with you, how about a medal? Very funny. Something more endearing. There's this ring over here. What makes that ring more endearing? It's only $50. Oh, gee. <laughs> now I don't know what I want. Well, make up your little mind. I have a family to go home to. Well, what would you spend if you were me? If I were you, I'd spend every waking moment wondering what I did to deserve such a fate. <laughs> I meant the jewelry. Look, can you just hold them both for me and I'll come back tomorrow morning? Yes, but only with proper identification. You mean you really don't recognize me? I'm Jack Benny. You're Jack Benny? 
With the radio show? That's what I'm telling you. I'm broadcast all over the country. I can't believe you don't recognize my face. Buddy, they don't broadcast your face on my radio. How can I know it's really you? Ask anyone. I'm a well-known comedian. Well, you do look funny. I'll give you that. <laughs> That's an old joke. It was new when you came in. Stop that. I don't see why you just can't take my word for who I am. I'm sorry. It's store policy. You'll have to speak to the manager and get his okay. All right. Then get me the manager. Yes. You're the manager? Yes. Can I help you? Yes. You see, I'm trying to have your employee hold two items for me, but he's giving me a hard time about it, and I want to report him. Oh, I'm sorry you had a problem with one of our sales clerks. Can you describe him? <laughs> Well, he's your height and weight, about the same age as you. And he happens to have your same build, too. And, coincidentally, he has a funny little mustache, just like yours. That describes our employee of the month. If he's your best employee, I'd like to see your worst. Yes? Wait a minute. Are you the only person who works here? Well, the other clerks here do the bare minimum if you call what they do work. Oh, enough already. Just file my complaint, will you? I'm sorry, but the complaint department's closed. Closed? What time did it close? That depends. What time did you come in? Look, I don't have any other identification on me. You can see me on all the posters around town for my latest movie, The Horn Blows at Midnight. Then you must be Jack Benny. Thank you. No one else would admit to being in that box office stinker. <laughs> Do you want your purchase gift wrapped? Not if it's extra. Oh, darn. It would've looked so pretty. What do I get for free? For free, we all wave goodbye and say bon voyage when you leave. Fine. I'll sleep on it and be back tomorrow morning. Something in the mirror you can look at. The nerve of some people. Well, it's getting late. I, I better get back. I'll finish shopping tomorrow. Bet the prices will be marked down real good by then, too. Help a fellow out, pal. Any spare change? I'm down on my luck. Say, you're Jack Benny, aren't you? That's right. You recognize me from my movie, The Horn Blows at Midnight, don't you? Oh. What's the matter? Didn't you see it? See it? I was the studio executive who okayed it. <laughs> oh, bah, humbug. Hey, bud. Who, me? Come here a minute. What is it? At this festive time of year, it is more than desirable we should take a little action. A little action? Yeah, I'm poor and destitute. Poor and destitute? For the daily double. Well, gee, I don't know. What happened to Union Workhouse and are there no prisons? Uh-uh. What? They don't have a chance. Why is that? They're not in a stable situation. Gee, I never thought of that. Well, thanks for the tip, but I got a better idea. What's that? Come here a minute. I'm betting on Midnight Darkness to show. Why is that? She's a nightmare. <laughs> okay. See ya at the Brown Derby. Oh, what's this now with these children? That was lovely. Thank you, mister. You're welcome, Sonny. My, but aren't you as cute as a button? Say, mister. Yes? Come here a minute. <laughs> Make a donation to our choir? Oh, so that's your racket. Lure someone in with your singing and hit them up for cash. A poor excuse for picking a man's pocket every 25th of December. You don't fool me. I wasn't born yesterday, you know. Mister, from the looks of you, you weren't born anywhere even close to yesterday. Oh, humbug. 
Watch Graham. Mommy, that man is scary. <laughs> Kids. And then I arrived back home. I double locked the door and put on my pajamas, slippers, and nightcap and sat down before the fire for a late night snack. All of a sudden, the fire leapt up, the windows flew open, and I heard the most bone chilling sound. Ebenezer, Ebenezer, Ebenezer Benny. Who, me? Yes, you, Ebenezer. My name's not Ebenezer. You've got the wrong fella. Say, what do you know? It's Boris Karloff. You're wrong, Ebenezer. I'm the ghost of Jacob Marley. You know, Boris, if that's your latest movie, I admit I haven't had a chance to see the film yet, but I'm sure you're just wonderful in the role. Oh, well, well, you don't believe in me. Wait a minute. Are you saying you're really not Boris Karloff, the great movie actor? In life... I was Jacob Marley, your lawyer. But your resemblance to Boris Karloff is uncanny. You even sound just like Karloff. I have a cold. You know, we were supposed to have Boris Karloff on this week's show, but since you insist you're not him, then I'll tell NBC's payroll department not to issue Boris Karloff a check for this week. Let's not get crazy now. <laughs> Listen to me, Ebenezer Benny. I have come from the netherworld to see you. You came all the way from the netherworld to see me? How wonderful! You see, the furthest someone's traveled to see my show up to now was Ronkonkoma. Do not mock me! Ronkonkoma, he says you're mocking him. Not them, you! I have come to warn you. Warn me? Of what? Did you need to go over my contract? Is there a legal matter I should know about? Is Milton Burrow about to steal one of my jokes? Again? Hear me, Ebenezer! Say, those are some pretty fancy cufflinks you got there. I wear the chains I forged in life. Now I am doomed. Doomed! Doomed? Doomed! I come to warn you. Spare yourself my fate. Your fate? Well, you see, that's where you're mistaken. I don't share your fate. I'm mostly in the radio and television business, while you're in the motion picture business. Business! Mankind was my business. The common welfare was my business. Charity, mercy, forbearance, and benevolence were all my business. <laughs> Yikes! You, Ebenezer Benny. Or a squeezing, wrenching, grasping wretch. A penny-pinching vein! I got your point. No offense, man. Well, all right. I forgive you. Thank you. Don't mention it. I won't. Oh, you must change your penny-pinching ways, you vain, petty wretch. Oh, cut that out! <laughs> My time draws near. And I must go. Well, that is too bad, because I was truly enjoying our chat. But if you have to go, you have to go. Don't let me stop you. But first... Oh, gee. <laughs> Tonight, you will be haunted by three spirits. The first will appear when the bell strikes one. The second at the stroke of two. And the third as the bell tolls three. Well, you make the bell sound so appealing. <laughs> See, that's, that was an example of a little joke. But Jacob, spirits arriving in the middle of the night. I really need to not get my beauty sleep interrupted. That's show business, you know. You understand what it takes for us stars to look as pretty as we do. Couldn't I take their visits all at once, say around noon next Thursday? No. I'll be all fresh and perky by then. No. Maybe we can split up the visits over a few days. I wouldn't want the spirits to feel rushed on my account. No. I want to no more. And heed the spirits when they appear. Remember, it's your last chance. Three spirits, eh? How nice. Jacob's made three new friends in the netherworld. Oh, I'll bet they're all lawyers. What am I saying? I gotta be exhausted, me seeing ghosts and all that humbug. Time to turn in and get some sleep. Jack Benny. Jack Benny! Now who can that be? You're the Almighty? Close, I'm your sponsor. <laughs> Time for a commercial. 
Oh, for goodness. Now, you have to run the commercial now. We're right in the very dramatic moment in the show. Say, that is kind of a catchy jingle, isn't it? can I say? Playing the violin relaxes me. Maybe not you, but it does me. Hey, moron! Keep it down! People are trying to sleep! It's silent night for a reason! You know, it's 12 o'clock. That's 1 a.m. All right already. I picked the wrong night to stop drinking. Ladies and gentlemen, it's Humphrey Bogart. You're mistaken, pal. I'm the ghost of Christmas past. Who's past? Your past. But you look just like Humphrey Bogart. Why does everyone tonight look like a movie star? Not everyone. No? You don't. Oh, quiet. <laughs> I'll have you know I've starred in a movie or two myself. And here I thought I was the only one dwelling in the past. <laughs> Are you the spirit whose coming was foretold to me? No. It must be some sort of crazy coincidence, me showing up in your bedroom like this at 1 a.m. Christmas morning. Of course I'm the spirit whose coming was foretold to you. I'm sorry. It's just that there you appeared all of a sudden without so much as a knock on the door or hello. So I have bad manners. Sue me. Now, come. Walk with me into the past. Do you remember this place? Gee, I do. It's Goodman's department store. I was just here this afternoon. I told you it was your past. But it was only a few hours ago. So I'm right. <laughs> When you reflect on how things went while you were at the store, what lesson did you learn? I learned that the sales clerk thinks he's a comedian. If by comedian you mean someone funnier than you, then he's right. No long, brother. It's people like you that's the reason people like me have bad manners. You're a tougher case to crack than the Maltese Falcon. I'm leaving this joint. Expect the next spirit when the clock strikes two. Good luck. Thank you. Not you. Good luck to the next spirit. He's gonna need it. Goodbye. Sheesh. What does Lauren Bacall see in him, of all things? I thought he'd show me something pleasant from my past, like the first time I met Mary, or the first time I saw a dollar bill. You know, I'm sentimental that way. Ebenezer Penny. Ladies and gentlemen, Peter Lorre. No, I'm not. Oh, then you must be the next ghost I was told to expect. No, I thought this was the waiting room for the next train to Altoona. <laughs> of course I'm the next ghost, you idiot! You're told to expect the ghost of Christmas past, and then the ghost of Christmas yet to come. What happened to Christmas present? You don't get one. You've been a bad boy. I mean the ghost of Christmas present. That's me. Behold. Oh, That's what I meant. Then don't mix up your noun with your adjective, you moron. Your English is atrocious. You vex me. Don't get me agitated. I'm sorry. It's your accent. It's difficult to understand you. My accent? I don't have an accent, you fool. Where I come from, everyone talks like me. You're the one who speaks funny. Finally, someone who thinks I'm funny. So now, uh, Peter... Ghost of Christmas Present, please stay on the script. Forgive me. <laughs> Mr. Present, I suppose I should ask, what's the reason for your visit? Oh, I don't know. I thought perhaps we could spend some time together and crochet a baby beanie. Oh, beanies are so adorable when they're that age, aren't they? You idiot! I'm here to teach you a lesson in morals. Please, I have places to go and things to do. This might be more difficult than it needs to be. I've traveled from afar to visit you. Afar? 
Isn't that in Constantinople? Not anymore. Why not? Well, you see, Istanbul was Constantinople, now it's Istanbul, not Constantinople. <laughs> Are you sure? I used to date a gal in uh, Constantinople. But every gal in Constantinople lives in Istanbul, not Constantinople. So if you've a date in Constantinople, you should be waiting in Istanbul. <laughs> Gee, that's confusing. I don't know why. Even old New York was once New Amsterdam. <laughs> well, why did they change it? I can't say. People just liked it better that way. <laughs> but I want to go back to Constantinople. But you can't go back to Constantinople now. It's Istanbul, not Constantinople. Gee, why did Constantinople get the works? That's nobody's business but the Turks. <laughs> Quick. There is a place we must go visit. It is the abode of a poor soul whose lousy employer pays a meager wages. He lives alone in a very small room in his employer's house. Do you recognize this wretched place? Yes, but I don't understand. This is Rochester's room behind the kitchen. Bingo! <laughs> now, be quiet. Shh! Jingle bells, jingle bells, jingle all the way. Santa Claus works once a year, but I work every day. <laughs> Christmas comes once a year, and when it does, it brings good cheer. How I love the sound of good cheer. <laughs> Time to start cooking my Christmas dinner. Cold lobster, shrimp cocktail to start, filet mignon and a bordelais sauce, a hefty portion of garlic mashed potatoes, and for dessert, Cherry's Jubilee Flambe. Chez Rochester is open for business, and the chef is cooking. Mmm, mmm. The aroma of that filet mignon sizzling on the stove is delicious. Huh? I wasn't expecting anyone. Who's there? Rochester, it's me. Oh, one minute, Mr. Benny. Let me straighten up a little. Mr. Benny! Switch the lobster and shrimp cocktail to a hot dog, the filet mignon to a can of baked beans, and... Merry Christmas, boss! Merry Christmas, Rochester. Say, did you hear all that clanging just now? Clanging? There was a whole bunch of clanging and noise. Oh, I was dusting. Oh. Are you taking up a collection again? I just gave last week. <laughs> no, I, I just need to borrow some sugar for my coffee. Well, well, whatever I have is yours. Thank you, Rochester. That's very gracious of you. This room is yours, the furniture is yours, the television set is yours, etc. and so forth. Like I said, whatever I have is yours. There might be some sugar in the cabinet. Help yourself. It's yours anyway. Thank you. <laughs> oh, gee. Anything wrong, boss? Your cabinet, it's empty. No, it ain't. See that there? Where? Over there, in the corner. I don't see anything. Look way, way back in the corner. There's nothing in there except a cobweb. That's it. <laughs> Gee, Rochester, I had no idea. Say, what's that you're cooking? Why, uh, that's my Christmas dinner, Mr. Benny. A hot dog and a can of baked beans. That's your Christmas dinner? I'm also having a fine wine to go with it. I didn't realize you knew anything about fine wines. I read about the wine in this book here. The Encyclopedia of Fine Wines. What do you know? <laughs> Look at page 253. Page 253. See that picture of the Chateau Rothschild? Yes. I'm going to drink in that picture with my eyes while I eat baked beans. <laughs> oh, so why does it smell like filet mignon cooking here? Oh, that's how you can tell the really good baked beans from the bad ones. Is that so? Yes, the man at the grocery store said these beans are the filet mignon of baked beans. <laughs> and to think I wasted money on filet mignon when I could have had beans. How do you like that? Well, let me not keep you from your Christmas dinner any longer, Rochester. Have yourself a Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas to you too, Mr. Benny. Oh, boss, there's one more thing before you go. Yes? I got this for you. Oh, what is it? It's such a small box. Because it's a small token of my appreciation. A pair of cufflinks. They're inscribed. Inscribed, you say? 
Well, it's so tiny, I don't know if I can make out what it says. Let's see. To Mr. Benny, the world's most wonderful boss. Thanks for everything. Oh, there's more. <laughs> Merry Christmas. Gee, Rochester, that's... There's more. <laughs> oh, with fond wishes from your faithful valet, Rochester. Thank you, Rochester. There's I... still more. <laughs> oh, and a happy and prosperous new year. I think that's it, unless it continues on the other cufflink. It's just a little sentiment, boss. Yes, but how did you get all of that to fit on a cufflink? Well, the jeweler said he could only fit a little sentiment on it, and that's a, a little, little sentiment. A little sentiment, yeah. <laughs> Gee. Well, this is very touching, Rochester. Thank you. It means a lot to me. Merry Christmas, Mr. Benny. Merry Christmas, Rochester. Well, I suppose I'll say good night now, so uh, good night. <laughs> Gee, even on his day off, he's that devoted to dusting. <laughs> Sure was nice of Rochester to give me these cuffs. <laughs> World's most wonderful boss. Huh. He saved up all year just to get you that for Christmas. He did. That was very generous of him. But you know, Rochester didn't really fool me. I know he was having champagne, a cold lobster and shrimp cocktail dish, filet mignon in a Bordelais sauce, with garlic mashed potatoes, and cherries jubilee flambe. How did you know that? It's in the script. He saved up all year just for that, didn't you, too? Oh, well, thank you for letting me know that, too. There's one more place we must visit. Who is it this time? Another person I'm accused of paying poorly? Not your first, Rodeo. <laughs> Behold, the Cratchit family. And over there, in that corner, that poor little crippled boy. Oh, we don't say things like that anymore, Mr. Benny. Oh, hello, Dennis. Mother brought us up not to use offensive words when we talk about other people. Well, that sounds like the right thing. Unless we're talking about you. <laughs> so you're playing the part of Tiny Tim, is that right? I sure am, Mr. Benny. He's one of Mr. and Mrs. Cratchit's boys. That's right. They're his parents. Yes. How did you know? <laughs> Well, Dennis, you see, call me Tiny. I want to stay in character. You may not know this, but that's what all the real actors do. <laughs> real actors. Look, Tiny. On second thought, Tiny is offensive too. Call me Slight of Stature. <laughs> Fine. Slight of Stature Tim. In this production, I have a role too. I play the part of Ebenezer Benny. Oh, you're the man who makes all our Christmases happy. I do? By not coming to our party. Oh, be quiet. Well, I'm glad to see you're in the show, especially after you said last week you never wanted to be in front of a crowd again. What was all that about, anyway? Last week, I went swimming, and a crowd gathered, and everyone pointed at me and laughed. Well, maybe you had a hole in your bathing suit. Oh, bathing suit. <laughs> Anyway, I'm looking forward to hearing you do that most famous of lines in A Christmas Carol. You know, the one that goes... You mean where I say, Bah Humbug? <laughs> now wait a minute, you don't say, Bah Humbug, that's my line. Why should you get all the good lines? Because I... I find that offensive. Cut that out! Bah Humbug is my line because I'm grumpy. So you have all the good lines and you're still grumpy? Some people are never... <laughs> oh, I don't have time for your nonsense. And if you're going to be a grump, then I don't have time for you. Sorry. <laughs> Jack, Jack. Yes, Don. We can't do the Cratchit family dinner scene. Why not, Don? Well, when the actors playing the family read the script, they jumped ship, ran like crazy to the really good theater, and landed parts in their production. <laughs> that darn impresario. <laughs> yes, they certainly attract all the best talent, don't they? So we had to cut the scene out of the show. Cut the entire Cratchit family dinner scene out? But that's an important scene. It's where Slight of Stature Tim does his tap dance in Cambridge. <laughs> it's a real show stop. Oh, shut up, Tiny! <laughs> oh, my. Look at the time. 
I must go. I have another engagement. Another soul to impart the lessons of charity, mercy, and all that. <laughs> Are you joking? I got tickets to catch Ethel Merman at the Flamingo. <laughs> There's all you can eat Struder. I can't be late for that. If Sydney Greenstreet gets there before me, all that'll be left will be Strudel fumes. <laughs> Goodbye, Ebenezer Ben. Strudel fumes. Now that's funny. <laughs> presence of the ghosts of Christmas yet to come, I fear you more than any specter I have seen. May I help you, sir? You again? <laughs> what are you doing here as the ghost of Christmas yet to come? I'm moonlighting. <laughs> Jewelry sales ain't what they used to be. You should see the cheapskate who came in here. <laughs> Speaking of that cheapskate, congratulations! You at Goodman's department saw a 10,000th customer. You won a $10,000 shopping spree. I did? I won a $10,000 shopping spree? Oh boy, how do I claim my prize? You don't. This is a dream, you silly man. <laughs> you mean, I didn't win anything? I didn't just win $10,000. Keep dreaming, buddy. <laughs> and that, ladies and gentlemen, is when I woke up. By then, it was Christmas morning. And oh, Jack. Hello, Mary. Everyone, it's Mary Livingston. Jack, what's that in your living room? That's my Christmas tree, Mary. I just put it up. You see, I went through an experience during the night that's transformed me into a warm and generous person who fully embraces the Christmas spirit, and I'm overjoyed to display my holiday cheer. Isn't it pretty? Jack, you decorated a cactus. <laughs> You can't expect me to make big changes like that all at once. <laughs> anyway, about your Christmas gift. Is it going to be like the gift you gave me last year? I'd appreciate something I can actually use. Well, what's wrong with what I gave you last year? It was a postage stamp. <laughs> and you used it? Yes, to mail you a thank you card. <laughs> well, it's the thought that counts, you know. Sure, if the thought was, how cheap can I get away with? Oh, stop that. In fact, I'm giving you something very nice this year. Is it big or small? Well, one man's big is another man's small, you know. Then is it light or heavy? And one man's light is another man's heavy. Well, then you better call that one man so I can ask him. <laughs> All right. I'll give you a hint. It's small, it's pretty, and you'll see a little message inscribed on it. Are you sure it's not another postage stamp? It's not! What did you want, anyway? Jack, I know we said we wouldn't ever mention it, but I feel I need to. Well, what's the matter? Well, you know how we promised we wouldn't spend more than $25 on each other for Christmas? What about it? I got something extra special for you this year. It'll replace an accessory of yours you've had ever since you were a little boy that's very sentimental to you, and you're very attached to it. But it's tiny, and you're a grown man now, so you need something bigger and more practical for what a grown man uses. Gee, what is it? A money clip. <laughs> I wanted to tell you because it costs $100. But please don't feel like you need to spend that much on me in return, because I got that for the sweetest, kindest, most wonderful, pleasant, generous man I know. Oh, gosh, Mary. Oh, you're not talking about me, are you? That's right. <laughs> I got it for Don, but he already has one, so I'm giving it to you. Um, look it. You stay here. I'll be right back. Where are you going? Goodman's department store. Jack, don't tell me you still haven't done your Christmas shopping. It's Christmas morning already. Yes, well, you could say I've got a horse there. Have you been taking racing tips from that racetrack tout again? Of course not. Don't be ridiculous. Then how much eggnog did you get? <laughs> Not a drop. And I'm also giving Rochester a raise. That much eggnog? Oh, don't be smart. And so, folks, as Tiny Tim observed... Slight of stature, Tim. <laughs> all right, all right already. As Slight of stature, Tim observed... Is it time for my line now, Mr. Benny? Yes. I wasn't certain because you sure seem to be taking your time with your line. Will you go on and deliver your line already? How can I when you keep talking? <laughs> all right, all right, I'll shut up. That's about it. <laughs> go ahead. Well, what's my cue again? As Slight of stature, Tim observed... 
God help us every morning. <laughs> well, that's as close as we're going to get. Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays, and Happy New Year to everybody. Good night, folks. <laughs>